All right, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you as we continue our series in Ecclesiastes. We're calling Seasons. What, what season of life do you find yourself in? Winter, spring, summer, fall. We've been speaking about the different seasons, but if you recall, we've been speaking about this metaphorically as well, even in our emotions, how winter can feel like a season of struggle, spring a season of rejuvenation, summer a season maybe of rest, fall a season of nostalgia or maybe getting back to things or whatever it is. What season do you find yourself in? I remember a specific season of my life and um, it's not a season I'm necessarily proud of, but uh, It was 2016. How do I know? Um, Many of you know I journal things and take pictures of things and make notes of different things so I can see patterns in my life. I don't want the enemy to scheme against me and not notice what he's and see what he's doing. But I also want to see areas of growth in my own spiritual life. So when I write and journal out a prayer, I will go back and say, answered prayer builds my faith. It strengthens my faith. And how quick are we to forget the goodness of God in different seasons of our life? And so that's always been a a helpful thing for me. So I know this was 2016 because I have even a picture of what I'm going to talk about today, but it was a season of my life where I was finding myself incredibly busy. Anybody ever get there? I was involved, it felt like, in everyone's life I knew. I had three kids, all active in sports. We were driving everywhere all the time. It felt like we were always in the car, always at Wawa, right? Just constantly going. In fact, I was coaching two of the teams. And so I'm running there even as a coach. I'm getting there. I'm helping out. I'm doing my best in what I can do in the different avenues. And so I was helping with a high school baseball team. I was helping with a basketball team. I was helping with a little league squad. I was everywhere. And on top of that, running the church, growing ministries, different small groups, different leadership. And I was loving every aspect of it. I really was. Notice I'm speaking in past tense. I was going so fast and so hard at life doing good things. I love being a dad. I knew this was a season. But at the same time, I was running myself so thin. I wasn't sleeping much. I was educating myself late at night. I was arriving early at meetings early in the morning, so I wasn't sleeping much. I was on the move constantly, and so there was a lot of nothing against it. I love it, but there was a lot of sheets and wah-wah in me, okay? And I'm just constantly moving and going and going and getting there and getting there. And everywhere I felt I was a little bit late, which brings a little bit of stress into your life. And so there's a little bit of anxiousness. I'm not there on time. I'm not scheduling enough margin in my life and I'm going and I'm going and I'm going and all of a sudden I felt something right here that I'd never felt before and all of a sudden my left arm just was like all of a sudden weird and I was trying to get my thing I'm like this this isn't good oh it's nothing it's nothing and then just a little bit later in the day it came back even more fierce to the point where I I called my wife I said "I, I don't like how this feels, and I I made the mistake of typing in some of my symptoms. You ever do that? Very peaceful activity to type in your symptoms, right? So I was typing in my symptoms going, oh man, I'm done. I'm I'm looking through this like, I got got to get to a hospital. This is the things that they, and so I went to the ER and they actually had me describe my symptoms. And before you know it, I'm in a hospital bed in the ER staring up at the ceiling. And I remember the ceiling tile above me. That's not an actual image. But I remember the ceiling. Can I ask this question again? What is God's will for you in this season of life? You see, sometimes, have you ever heard this verse? Have you ever heard that verse? Don't grow weary in doing good. Have you ever heard that verse? It's right out of your scripture. So what scares me a little bit about that verse is that means it's possible, right, to grow weary even doing good things. Have you ever found that? I'm doing good. I'm doing great. I'm I'm being involved in my kids' lives. I'm being involved in my church. I'm being involved in other people's lives. I'm going from here. I'm going from here. I'm going from here. Okay, yeah, Holy Spirit, we could argue the food it takes not the best, but otherwise I'm doing good. And I'm finding myself laying on a hospital bed in my early 40s going, 
what on earth is happening? And all of a sudden, I didn't feel so invincible. All of a sudden, I, I felt vulnerable. All of a sudden, I felt my wife and our current housing situation, everything was a little bit more vulnerable. All of a sudden, I, I started thinking, hey, I'm going so fast. Did I almost leave my three kids vulnerable? I, mean, I, I was really like laying there for the first time in my life. And, said, you, and some of you were thinking, Chris, it took you to 40. Some of you still aren't there yet. We think we're superhuman, don't we? And we try to do everything, everything, everything. I, 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 I don't want to miss a season. Oh, man, Pastor Chris was preaching about seasons. I don't want to miss a season. And we're going, and we're going, and we're going, and we're going. Is it possible? You don't have to learn the way I did. Because God is very capable of going, stop. I've heard people, their testimony is God used a car accident. God used an illness in our family. God used a torn ACL. God used cancer. God used a physical infirmity. He got my attention. And in the evil of our world, where we will have sickness, we will have disease, we will have struggles, we will have difficulty, sometimes God uses those things in our life to say, hey, I want to spend time with you. And I've watched people beat those seasons of life by drawing closer to God. Is it possible God has allowed something in your life in this season to use it to grow you closer to him? And you're looking at it as the biggest obstacle of your life, the biggest frustration or the biggest dread of your life or the biggest fear of your life. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, have mercy on me. I, I think I was going too hard. You know, I, I look at my scripture. It says God created the heavens and the earth in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. Can I ask you a question? Do you think he rested because he was tired? You think the God of the universe was just shot? I mean, that was a lot. You're talking about the God who does not slumber nor sleep. So why did he give us this principle of rest? Is it possible he knows that sometimes, even in serving him and doing good things, if we don't take time to rest, we will fry ourselves out and be ineffective for everyone who might be used by what you bring to the table. It's counterintuitive. We want to serve. We want to give. We want to reach out to people. We want to love people. We want to be there for them. And I want to be there for them. And I want to be there for them. I want to be there for them. But if we never stop and say, am I giving myself a season of rest so that I stay here? It's very hard sometimes to submit to God altering your life with something he allows into it. We fight it sometimes. We push back on it. But I remember in that season of life saying, I've got to establish some safeguards around myself. I've got to know thyself. Have you ever heard that phrase, know thyself? I've got to know me. I'm tempted to go too hard. I'm tempted to pursue too many things at one time. I'm tempted to leave no margin and set up a meeting at 7.30 to 8.30 and the next meeting's at 8.30 instead of 9.30 because you know you're going to overtalk the meeting and then you're going to need to drive. And you stress yourself out. Are you ever tempted to know, know what you don't do well and you do it anyway? And you're going like crazy and you're wondering why the family's yelling at each other. You're wondering why there's so much stress in your life. You're wondering why you're upset at your boss or you're upset at your kids or whatever. You're wondering. It's because there probably isn't some submission in your life to God's will for you to take seasons where you rest. So, uh, so I thought, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? And it was in that season where I was kind of laid up for a little bit of time as they figured out what was going on with me. And praise God, praise God, it was actually acid reflux, okay? So, so I have learned something, all right? It was a lot of acid reflux that manifested itself like a heart disease. And, and many of you know that that can happen, right? Um, I guess you shouldn't have spaghetti and then a sheet's coffee and then like, yeah, I guess you shouldn't, you know? I, I just... But I learned something about what changes I needed to make, but a bigger change I made was something I found in Scripture. And I realized I got to surround myself by people who can point out things, carry me in seasons, be there for me in seasons. So I started making a list of people I needed to get in my life. 
because I really began to see that God was using a season of me being a little laid up to see I needed to depend on other people. I know I'm speaking to Northeast Pennsylvania Auditorium, but I got a bunch of different countries as well as states on there as well. But in our area, if you're watching online, in our area, we tend to be a little independent. We tend to go, I got it. We tend to be like, yeah, I know I probably should use a couple people, but I'm going to do it. And we kind of overwhelm ourselves. We got to know thyself a little bit about this area and about our lives. And God was showing me, I have something in this next season for you, and you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. Can you submit to what I want and use others? Is it possible you're going so hard and you're doing good, but is it possible you're holding back other people from having a chance to minister in the very area God is using you because you're doing it all yourself? Oh, but administration is tough and getting other people involved is tough. But what is God's will for you in this season? Is your busyness actually your refusal to ask for help? Is that actually why you're busy? Is your busyness a refusal to admit you can't do it? Is your busyness a refusal to acknowledge you simply want to keep up with the Joneses and you're afraid you won't if you don't stay busy? Is it actually something you're pushing back on the Lord and not trusting him with what he's asking you to do? in this season of life. I began to write in my journal what I need. I said, Lord, I need, a, I need an advisor in my life. I can't just keep going to my own head about decisions. I need a mentor. I need somebody, my wife, and, and if you're a little bit older, don't get offended by this. She goes, you need somebody old in your life. I'm like, you're right. I need like an old man in my life. Somebody who's outside the game. He don't care anymore, right? And that had been a big, huge blessing because the Lord did send that. I, 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 taught, I need somebody to like protect me. I need an accountability partner. I need somebody to say, hey, Chris, I'm watching you, and hey, I love you, brother, but um, you might want to, really, again, I'm doing it, yeah, yeah. I need a tutor, because you know what? My life is changing, and there's people who have done things that I'm doing professionally that are ahead of me and could say, hey, here's some of the things I want to watch for. I, I, I wrote down, I, I need a friend, because passionate people can also get very discouraged, Maybe you're a young lady out there, you're passionate about your new startup, or you're excited about this. Have you also noticed this about yourself? You can also get super discouraged. Isn't that interesting? Passionate people can go from like, whoa, to I don't even know why I do it. I don't even know why I do it. I need a friend who will support me and go, come on, man, keep it going. I, I, I need a coach that will keep driving me in the areas where I'm tempted to be a little lazy. But the Lord showed me even a seventh one, and I, I call it the bonus one. I'm going to give it to you today. But some things in my life, and I began to submit to a verse in Scripture that among counselors, there is wisdom. Among many counselors, there's wisdom. And I found myself in a pretty dry area of my life, and I began a file called Renew. I need to renew my life here. I need to renew my thinking here. I need to be renewing this here. And I kept writing that renew so much, I thought, you know what? That would be a really cool name for a church someday, God. And that is actually what I ended up presenting to the leadership. And it came out of that whole period of my life. What I didn't know that fall is I would be a point leader in purchasing revivals. God hadn't shown that to me yet, but I realized later that God was using that time period to say, you're going to make a ton of mistakes if you don't have more counselors in your life. And even though you're running doing good, I'm calling other people to come around you. And God was so faithful in that. I prayed hard and I got loved on good and I surrounded myself With an older man, I surrounded myself with an advisor in pastoral ministry. I surrounded myself with an accountability partner. I surrounded myself with somebody who was just a supportive friend. And I've lost some people on that list even this year. But at the same time, I look back at that season and I realize I could not have done what God was asking me to do if I refused to submit to the fact he didn't want me to do it alone. 
Can I ask you? Is it possible you are feeling fried out, discouraged, and overwhelmed because of your inability to submit to one of God's counsels for us, taking time to restore and renew? On a beach? Sure, do it. If you're watching on a beach, go out, go get it. But far more importantly, because you can go on five straight vacations and still be exhausted. You need the renewal that comes from the word of God. And it's these seasons where God's calling us to say, hey, I want you to submit what I have planned right now. Don't fight me on this. You're one of my stubborn kids, if you will. And I want to teach you. It's a season of life that's difficult to navigate, but it's a season of life that has taught me so much. And I hope today will resonate with you because I believe it's one of the number one problems Solomon had. He wrote the book of Proverbs and it was proverbial wisdom. It was beautiful wisdom. And he spoke about how to live a life that's a blessed life. But we've been studying in this series, the book of Ecclesiastes, which it seems he wrote later in life. And instead of the proverbial wisdom of Proverbs, we have much more of a speculative wisdom. He says the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. And this time it's more like, learn from my mistakes. I make poor choices. I had poor discernment. He had the wisdom and he had the leadership. But it doesn't seem like Solomon had people around him. And in that isolation, it's as if you're reading the book of Ecclesiastes, like he's sitting up in an empty throne room going, look at this kingdom, and look at this. It's worthless. It's meaningless. And he feels empty. Is it possible that there's a message for all of us to learn from his life on what not to do to keep from not finishing well? In this series, we've been looking at different acronyms. I hope you've enjoyed it. From rapata to ta-da to gur, tiz, jig, lot, let, get, shadow, dash, schemes. And in each one of those, we've been speaking about what's God's will in that season of life and what you're currently going through. And today, I want to call our message, Keep. Specifically, the king's commands. For Solomon has something he wants to teach about submission. It's something we maybe kind of shudder at a little bit. For many of you may have grown up in church and hearing submission and hearing different things, and you look at submission as weakness. When you hear that word, you think that, that, that's weakness. But can I encourage you? As I review scripture, I don't think there could be a stronger virtue in someone than the ability to submit to the authority that God's put over their life. But more specifically to the authority he is in their life. In your season of busyness, don't make God have to get your attention. Let's learn today from the experience and see what God has for us today in his word. Heavenly Father, we open your word here in Ecclesiastes and we long to hear from you. We love to search out the whole counsel of scripture here at Renew and, and we understand that this book is difficult to understand but we know there's a message for us to learn. Throughout all the book of Ecclesiastes, we see this umbrella. Obey God's commands. And it will go well for you. There's an aspect in our society where independence is lauded, the lack of dependence on anyone else, the I got it, leave me alone, or even the I want all the credit mindset prevents us from doing things that you often desire for us. And so, Lord, today, as we listen to your word, I pray if it be your will, you would remove the room of distraction. We need to hear from you. I pray you'd humble our hearts so we won't be just be hearers of the word. We need to be doers as well. And then, Lord, I pray we would be different because we visited this place. And thank you so much and give a, a blessing to those who made a priority this Sunday to either tune in or sit here in the house under your awesome words. We pray all this and all renewed Bible said. 
Amen. All right, what do you got for us, Kohelet? If you're new to our series, if you've come to one of our camps as a family or your kids came and you're visiting with us, we've been in this book and, and Solomon takes this interesting approach. He allows this shadowy type figure to speak into the audience, almost like a professor in the front of the room. And it's as if Solomon takes a seat and listens as well. And this figure in the Hebrew is Kohelet, or it means preacher. And he will often give his thesis, and then he'll break it down saying, I'll prove it to you, I'll prove it to you, I'll prove it to you. And so here's his thesis today. Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. As I was in the ER that day, I took a selfie of myself. You say, that's odd. It was. You want to know why? I wanted to see what I looked like years from now. I am not about to show you the picture, <laughs> but I have it. I have it. And I'm looking at it. My hair still looked great. Don't worry. But as I'm looking at it, I can see the stress. And I know my facial expression was, really, dude? Really? And I wanted that as a remember remembrance for me. That in some ways, I really had felt like I did this to myself. Because there were people speaking in my life, even during that season, saying, hey, keep in mind, man, you can't just go, keep, hey, keep in mind, I, you're doing another class? Well, yeah, I've got to continue my education. Keep in mind, you're, you're helping with that too? Yeah, I've got to be there for the, you know, keep in mind. There were people trying to get the little keep in mind. Have you ever had those people in your life? They love you. Hey, you might just want to keep in mind. And when I got that wisdom that I need to surround myself with people, my countenance literally changed. Have you ever seen pictures of you in the past and you can see the stress on your face? Oh, you smiled for the picture, but you know what was behind that picture, don't you? You know how you were actually feeling during that picture. That picture, in some ways, you look at as a fraud of what was actually going on in your head. Solomon, in his incredible depth of wisdom, says, when a man finds wisdom, even his face will show it. Pursuing help was one of the greatest things I could have ever had happen, for I brought into my life some of the most wonderful and important people to this day. I can't imagine doing ministry the way I had been doing it in 2016. I was doing good, doing good things, but my countenance is totally different after surrounding myself with counselors. Solomon has something to teach that person whose face is hard and overwhelmed. And he says this, I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go out from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme and who may say to him, what are you doing? What's going on here? Let's continue to read. He says this, Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what he is to be. For who can tell him how it will be? What's going on here? He continues, No man has the power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor... Will wickedness deliver those who are given to it? All this I observed while applying my heart to all that was done under the sun. When man had power over man to his hurt. It's as if Solomon steps back from his kingdom. And what's to remind everybody, especially those who think they can just come in and out of his presence and disrespect him. Especially those who think they can talk bad about him and, and get together and complain about his leadership. Especially those who question his decision making. He, it's like he wants them all to know this. Keep in mind your authority. Keep that in mind. I'm the king. I'm supreme. I make the decisions. And you can comment, post, and do whatever you want. But I'm going to do what I'm going to do. We all kind of step back. And Solomon says, that's what leadership is under the sun. Keep in mind your authority. Keep the king's command. 
Why? Because of God's what to him? Oath to him. See, Solomon understood something about this theologically. He's saying, it's God who put me in my authoritative position. So if you have a problem with me as your authority, do you know who your real problem is with? Him. Scripture teaches this layer, if you will, of authority that is good for us to keep in mind. Especially when we're underneath authorities we don't tend to respect or like or possibly want to complain about. Has that ever been your case? Have you ever found yourself under a certain authority that you don't like, don't respect, think is unfair, think is unjust? I think we've all experienced authorities like that, whether it be a coach, a teacher, a parent, a government. How do we respond in those moments? Solomon says, under the sun, keep in mind, not under the S-O-N, Jesus, but under the sun, in this secular world, authority makes the rules, and remember that, but just keep this in mind, there's a layer over that, and that's God. Romans 13 teaches this principle, it says this, everyone must submit himself to their governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. You mean to tell me all the good authorities, all the ones I like? Mm -mm. Even Nebuchadnezzar's. Even Samson's. Even Nero's. In fact, Scripture is often written to people who are suffering under very difficult authorities. I had a father come to me one time because isn't it interesting how um, our first taste of being underneath an authority we might not possibly like is often coaches. And there might be a coach and your child is struggling with it. That was this father's situation. His daughter was struggling with this. She was a sweet, wonderful young girl. She had a fierce tenacity to her on a, on a court, but um, her coach was just a yeller. And it did not, it just crushed her spirit. It, 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 let's go! was not her thing. In fact, it often brought tears. And the father's kind of frustrated. He's like, you know, I, I watch these games and she's not playing well because he won't shut his mouth. He's so loud. He's just like, and he's all frustrated with me. I see him. I'm like, so, so what, what has been your problem? Well, I was thinking about just going and hitting him. No, he didn't say that. But, but that's how he felt. I mean, dad was fired up. There is a reason we hear the term mama bear right? Okay. Because parents see that sometimes they're like, oh my goodness. And then the child comes home and they're upset and they're frustrated. And you're like, I just want to remedy to this. But is it possible that God has established that authority in that child's life for such a season to teach her something? I don't know. I think my wife and I made a dumb decision joining this team. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait, maybe that's true. So maybe at the end of the season, you say, hey, look, there's an opportunity for us to get out from that authority. It's probably wisdom we do. But what if it's possible God is using even this difficult authority to toughen her up a little bit? Maybe to get her used to something in life. Is it possible she could look at this authority as not just over her, but established by God that he wants to use this to refine her and sharpen her? And then you gotta be really careful when you do this one. Or maybe just for like you and your wife to refine you a little bit. Oh, it's a hard way to learn. And yes, it is. But could there be something because scripture tells me all authority, whether it's that teacher who just doesn't get it, or whether that's boss who, oh my word, this boss, whatever it is, could it be possible God's even using a difficult authority in your life to teach you something, to grow you, or maybe just to help you learn how difficult it is to submit to authority that you don't respect but do because you understand the layer. There's my earthly authorities, but there's an ultimate authority. And my ultimate authority tells me that he is in control and there's no authority over me, that he's not allowed, even the difficult ones. When I'm going through seasons of struggle under authority, may I keep in mind who established my authority. Solomon looks out again. He says, then I saw the wicked buried. 
They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. I saw people who were wicked going in and out of the holy place. And people were like, oh, you're so spiritual. Solomon's a little frustrated here. This also was vanity. Then he continues and he says, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. When people get away with stuff, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. It's like if they get away with a little, they'll do even more evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, he says this, that yet I know it will be well with those who fear God because they fear God before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear God before God. And what I found interesting about this is I was looking at this, I'm like, wow, it's like Solomon steps back from his kingdom and says, keep in mind not only your authority, but keep in mind your responsibility. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Solomon's hearing people question him. Solomon's people acting like maybe they should be the ones in charge. And he's kind of saying, though, keep in mind what your responsibility is. For even he can't control what goes on in his kingdom. They, these people do this. They're faking it over there. They're, it's like he sees this, but I can't even fully control what goes on. And so keep in mind who set up your authority, but keep in mind it's not your responsibility to fix the whole kingdom or to fix all the people or to question every injustice. I can't even keep it in control. You can almost hear this frustration. I think it's wise for us at times when it comes to authority to keep in mind our responsibility. Scripture says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good, for this is the will of God. I've been given a responsibility, and that is submit to my human institutions. Why? For Christ's sake, because he asks me to. But isn't it interesting, sometimes when we think some authority figure is being unjust, we use that as an excuse to be unjust ourselves. Well, well you, look how, look, look, that person over there, they're doing that, then they're doing that. Even Solomon's pointing it out. Yeah, that happens in the kingdom. Those people are getting away with it. Those people are getting away with it. So why don't I get away with it? I had a brother in Christ share with me one time a, a situation, he said, hey, I got this friend. He, he told me there's this guy. He's getting people like thousands of dollars back on their taxes. I mean, it's like huge amounts. And he's like, man, you got to come with me. We got to go. And he's like, so he started telling me where this guy was. And it was like down this road and like a left over here. And I'm like, I'm kind of stepping back. He goes, yeah, it sounded a little shady. But I mean, my word. And so he was receiving some counsel, like, hey, maybe, maybe you better not do that. Well, the guy seems legit, though. They went, one of the guys went there, and, and the guy was like, all right, well, you know how the government says, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, we don't have to do this. And all of a sudden, they started realizing that there was some really wrong practices going on there. But they're getting away with it. Isn't that frustrating? They're making this. I mean, well, I'll try to do it the honest way, and then I'm getting penalized, so I'm just thinking about sticking it to the man. In other words, it was like, if I'm underneath unjust leadership, well, then I can be unjust. But, but Scripture says, know your responsibility. Even if there's injustice in the authority above you, you have a higher authority that watches what you're doing. He received the counsel to not go there. He got back to me a couple years later. He goes, hey, you know, every one of them had to report to the IRS that people were going there. It didn't go well for them. I said, oh, man, the Lord saved you. He goes, no, you saved me. I said, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. You saved yourself when you went down that road. I always think that's a red flag, down that road. Keep in mind your authority. Keep in mind your responsibility. There's a vanity that takes place on the earth, that there's righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. You want to talk about unfair? Here's something that's unfair. There's righteous people out there, and some of the things that happen in their life are the things that should be happening to the wicked people. And then there's wicked people out there and they get some like really righteous good things. I said, this is vanity. This is meaningless. I look at out in society and I see wicked people getting like really good things and really neat righteous people getting really bad things. I I'm upset about that. And almost in this default, he says, I commend joy. For man is nothing better under the sun than to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go well with him in his toil. 
through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the busyness that is done on the earth, how neither day nor night do one eyes sleep. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find out. In almost a sense of kind of defeat tone, I hear, keep in mind your capacity. When it comes to authority, keep in mind the authority and who established it. Keep in mind your responsibility and what God's asked you to do. But keep in mind your capacity and what you're actually capable of doing and what you haven't been called to do. Scripture reminds us New Testament believers In 1 Timothy chapter 2, pray for all people, ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. If you're a young person here today and say, I've never lived in some sort of kingly empire, that king is any authority over you, whether it be a teacher, a coach, a parent, a boss, a board. We're called to live lives before God of dignity. And we're called to pray for our leaders. And you might say, oh, I pray for them. That, no, 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 no. It says with the heart of what? Giving thanks for them. Because God established them. He's using them in ways and even when they're unjust, even when they're evil, even when we see them doing wrong, we have to remember, if God's allowed it, we must remember he's ultimately over all of it. It can calm our hearts. It can keep us in what we are capable of doing and what he has not asked us to do. And it can also inspire us to desire to find ourselves in an authority position where we can actually do something about it. Keep in mind your capacity. I think this is important because there's people in life who continually talk negatively about their authorities. And sometimes they don't figure out until they're 40, after the ninth job, that maybe it's not the authority. Maybe it's you. Everyone's an idiot. But everywhere you go, there you are. And it might not be that stupid teacher, that dumb coach, that idiot boss, that foolish person. You may have a submission struggle. You might also be a budding entrepreneur and leader who wants to lead. But keep in mind, if God's called you for a season underneath authority, when you're fighting it, complaining about it, yelling about it, angry about it, resentful about it, you know who you actually have a problem with? Your ultimate authority. And when you have that doctrinal base behind your life, it helps you keep in mind things when it looks like worldly leaders are getting away with things. It, it gives you peace when you think the injustice that's occurring to you is never going to end, it gives you hope. Because in this world, whether you like it or not, there will be times you're underneath really difficult authority. Keep in mind, your authority has been established by God. Your responsibility is to submit to it, and your capacity is do what he's called you to do. At times speak, at times be quiet, at times voice your communication in dignity and respect, and at times just say, God, I know you're in control, but can you please acknowledge this isn't right? The preacher kind of says, whoever does <laughs> and keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know a proper time in a just way. 
It's as if he says, those who keep a command on this side of eternity under the sun are not going to know an evil thing. Here, here's the deal. If you pull up to a red light and it's red and you don't stop and you get pulled over, kind of on you, it's going to happen. But if you obey it, you're not going to get treated and, and pulled over and all those things. And you say, well, that stinks. I don't like red lights. Okay. All right. Uh, red lights are dumb. They're a waste of my time. I don't even like the township that put up my red light, so I'm not, I'm not, going, I'm not stopping at that one. I'm going right through it because they're fools. Okay, but I bet you'll have a problem when someone else goes through a red light and hits your car. I will because I want the entire world to revolve around what I want. I understand that. But God has established authority in our lives also to protect us. You do? But, but Lady Proverbs has something. What's that? Well, many fa- seek the face of a ruler, but it's from the Lord that a man gets justice. Yeah, I, I want justice. Yeah, well, you're not actually going to find that in human leaders for the most part. In fact, you're going to find a lot of earthly leaders are very difficult to submit to. And that's why you need to know it's actually from the Lord where you'll get justice. No, no, if I get this person, if this person is there for me, if I get this person in place or whatever, I'm going to have a better life. It's actually from the Lord you'll get justice because on this earth, Lady Wisdom tells us you're going to run into all sorts of leaders and many will seek the face of the leaders, she says, but they're all just thrones of injustice. In fact, there's going to be a lot of thrones of injustice. In fact, she gives us four specific characteristics of a throne of injustice and maybe you've had to Submit to this at some point in your life. Here's one. Threatening leadership. Like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked ruler over a people. When you are underneath a threatening type of leader, it's a very difficult work environment. It's a very difficult way to lead. When a young man knows, if you miss your first shot, you're never playing again the rest of the game. That's a very difficult way to play a game. When a teacher says, you make one, mis- one mistake, there's a threatening to that. And, it, and we all make mistakes, but you will find on earth, you'll be underneath threatening leadership. You're also going to find on earth, you'll be underneath fluctuating leadership. When a land or a country sins or transgressions it ways, it'll have many rulers. The rulers will just rotate, Scripture says. But with a man of understanding and knowledge, its stability will long continue. Whenever you see stability in an organization, there's often things that the Lord's really blessing. Constant turnover is a result oftentimes of instability or fluctuating leadership. It's very nerve-wracking to serve under fluctuating leadership. You also find on earth, you'll, you'll have callous leaders over you. A ruler who lacks understanding is a cruel oppressor, but he who hates injustice will gain and prolong his days. You will have times in your life, college student, you're going to have a callous professor. They're not going to care. Like, oh, my assignment, you know, um, I I needed to go home for that. Oh, well, see you at midnight. Or, oh, come on. Now, if it's your seventh time reaching out to that professor, look in the mirror. But you will find there will be callous leaders over you. How are you going to handle that before your ultimate authority? There'll be times, fourth, You'll have disgraceful leaders that embarrass you. You'll actually be ashamed to be a part of their leadership. It's like, man, I was really embarrassed about how that was handled. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. So so Lady Wisdom kind of gives us this heads up. Under the sun, there's going to be thrones of injustice. And they'll be threatening and fluctuating and callous and disgraceful. That will happen. Can, can, how, many, how many of you remember the story of the parable of the persistent widow? Do you know that one? It, it's awesome. It's found in Luke 18. It's this incredible parable about a woman who was under a throne of injustice. Let, 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 me, let me remind you of this because I, I think it's interesting for us as we seek to apply this to our lives. Jesus speaking now. So this is Jesus teaching us. He says this, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to pray and not lose heart. When you're underneath thrones of injustice or leadership that's either callous, threatening, discouraging, whatever it is, pray and don't lose heart. 
In other words, it's possible to lose heart in those situations. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Total under the sun judge. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. There was someone trying to hurt this woman. And she was asking for justice. And for a while, he refused. He just refused to help her at all. Very callous. But afterwards, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll give her justice, that she will not beat me down from her continual coming. And that beat down's interesting. It means to blacken under the eye. It gives the idea that she'll make my name look bad if I don't start dealing with this. And the Lord said to the crowd listening, Jesus says, hear what the unrighteous judge said? Do you hear what he just said? He said, because she annoys me to death, I'll do what she wants. You hear that? Yeah, Jesus, where are you going with this? Will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give them justice speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man returns, will I find faith on earth? It's as if when people see injustice continuing on, they can really lose heart. And you might be in a situation, whether you're a young person here today, whether you're in a place of work, whether it's the state of your country, whether it's an environment you find yourself in, whatever you feel it is, and it's causing you to really lose heart underneath that kind of leadership, Jesus says, I want you to keep coming to me the way that woman went to that unrighteous judge. Why? There's something about the keep coming. Keep coming. Can I talk to all the young moms with toddlers in the room? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bother you for just a second and then forgive me. Ready? Mom, 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 mom. Hey, mom, mom, mom. All right. Right? That's the idea here, okay? Jesus says, that's what I want. Why? Because he wants us to wear him out? No. Because I'm a person and I want a relationship with you. And you might be in a season where you feel you're underneath a heavy weight of authority, but there's something I want to teach you there. And I'm not calling you to a throne of injustice. I'm calling you to a throne of grace. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16 says, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Come to the throne. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep this in mind. Whenever you go through these difficult times under difficult leadership, keep coming to me. I'm the ultimate authority. Know who your authority is. Know your responsibility is to keep coming. And know your capacity. You can't change everything. But you can come to me who can change everything. Keep coming. Keep coming. I broke it down. Let us draw with confidence. What makes you draw confidently towards someone? You know them. You know how they're going to respond. You know they're not going to reject you. Jesus says, come to me. He's knowable. He is a knowable Savior who says, come. And and second, it says, to the throne of grace. He sits on the throne. He's eternal. He's sovereign over everything. I'm a knowable, eternal Father. Come to me. Come to me. Keep coming. I'm ultimately in charge. I've allowed this for a reason. Even if you don't like it, I'm going to use it. That we might receive mercy and find grace. You're not going to get, what are you doing here? Get away from me. In fact, it's the opposite. I'm empathetic. You'll receive mercy. You come before a knowable, eternal, empathetic person to find grace. And help. I want to personally help you. God the Father, child of God, is your dad. And he says, come. Keep coming. But you know what? Aren't we tempted to go? He doesn't want to hear from me. I've been so bad lately. He doesn't want to talk to me. Oh, you know what? He's probably going to say, you again. Or we'll say things like, dearly Father, I know you're sick of me praying. 
And we'll say things like, Heavenly Father, I know you're too busy for me. Wrong. It's a lie. I, 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 know, I know you probably don't want to hear from me again. Wrong. Lie. I, I, I know I keep, I keep failing and I'm so dirty in your eyes. Wrong. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, child of God. And he wants you to keep coming because he loves you. And I know you're the God of the world and you probably don't care about me. No, I'm a personal God who wants a relationship with you. Keep coming. It's powerful. And it seems like this simplistic doctrine, but when we understand that you serve an authority figure that loves you, you pour into his presence. But you want to know one of the number one reasons people don't see God as a loving, compassionate, empathetic, knowable, personal God? You want to know why? Because of an authority figure in their life that they attribute their characteristics to God. I have heard grown men say, my dad would only talk to me if I was performing well. My mom will never give me grace. It's always what I'm doing wrong as a mother. So I don't even want to call her. She'll say, you never visit me. It's because I'm going to get berated the whole time I'm there. I've heard people into their adult life say, I've never heard my dad say I love you. I've never even heard it come out of his mouth. And so when I think about God, sometimes, I've, if I'm honest, I think about the authority figures in my life. Oh, Chris, I had the worst pastor who was so mean to me, so hard on me. And so every time I come in church, I see a pastor, I'm like, ah! It's because of an authority figure. That's why we have to know the scripture. God says, I'm not like that. Keep coming. And then you, some of us say, well, I, I have kept coming. But we have to know our authority, that we're allowed to come into his presence. We need to know our capacity and we need to know our responsibility is to keep coming to him. And when we know that, we excitingly approach the throne of grace to get help in our time of need. And I've had even people say to me, I've done that. I've been crying to God. Chris, you don't understand. I've, I've even done that thing where I get on my knees like, God, please. Please, I need help. There's so much injustice on me. It's not fair what's going on. And I, and I don't hear anything from God. And to that, I just want to ask a quick question, not judgmentally. Has God been silent for you, child of God? Or has your Bible been closed? Because you will often find God hasn't been silent. Your Bible's been closed. One of his number way, one ways to counsel, advise, tutor, offer his friendship is through his word. And if we're not careful and not reading it, our prayer life will get bombarded by all that junk we believe on the outside. You're too busy for me. You probably don't want to talk to me. No, no, no. Keep in mind. And when you love and are excited to approach God, you'll say what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, oh, blessed are those who keep your commands. Oh, blessed are those. Have any of you read Psalm 119? I'm encouraging you to read your Bible today here as we close this sermon. But have any of you ever read Psalm 119? And some of you are thinking, is that the really long one? Yes, it is. Is this super long one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super long. But you know what's going on there? What? All right, jump in the seminary really quick as we close our sermon out today. It's an acrostic. What? Watch this. Psalm 119 is an acrostic poem in the Hebrew. Okay? So you have 22 stanzas in Psalm 119 for 22 Hebrew letters with eight verses in each stanza for a total of 176. For example, this is the Hebrew word aleph. Aleph is a symbol that kind of looks like an N almost, doesn't it? But I want you to note something. Every word in the Hebrew will start with Aleph in Psalm 119. So this first stanza that's eight verses long all starts with Aleph. And you're looking over here going, I don't see it. Because Hebrew is read right to left. So if you look here, the Hebrew word right here is always Aleph and it goes that way. In English, you don't see it. But in Hebrew, as you study the text on that lower level of inductive study, you see that it's an acrostic and Aleph is used. That's true of all 22 stanzas. 
And the whole chapter is the psalmist going how much he loves God's commands and how much they help him with his life. Just, just, I, I, I love Mem. Are you guys too, are you with me? Oh yeah, we love Mem. That's the best one. Mem is great. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm hoping I'm exciting you to possibly read Psalm 119 this week. Because each one of these stanzas helps us on the journey of life. It's like this guy's going on a hike. And he's telling us about how God helps him along the hike. Aleph. Season of discouragement. Great eight verses to read. One of the great verses. Blessed are those whose ways blame us, who walk in the way of the Lord. Bet. Bet is great for seasons of temptation. That's where we get the verse, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Gimel. Gimel is a great word for a season of confusion. Those are great eight verses to kind of coach you through seasons where you just feel so confused. Dilet. Dilet is an interesting one. It's a season of sorrow and times of difficulty. Great eight verses that talk to that part of your life on the life's journey. Hey. Hey is a season of straying. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. Give me life in your ways. Great eight verses when you feel like I've kind of strayed away from God. Vav, season of fear. Zion, a season of change. Het, or hak is actually how you say it. A season of anxiety. Maybe tet, a, a season. Teth, look at this one. It's a season of trials. It's good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn from your statues. Yod. Yod is a season of influence. Kaf is a season of persecution. Lamda is a season of gratitude. And Mim is what the verses are that coached me in that time of life that I need people around me to help me through these seasons. And I need to submit to God's will to not do life on my own and not make decisions on my own. Mem says this, your commandments make me wiser than my enemies for it's ever with me. Your commandments are like an advisor, like my top consultant. When I have a struggle in life, I go straight to the word of God. It's like a consultant in my life. He continues and he says, I have more understanding than all my teachers. I get out in front of people who teach me. For your testimonies are my meditations. I think about it. I understand more than the aged for your precepts. It's like I got these proverbs hidden in my heart. They're like a mentor to me and a wise guide in my life. And then the psalmist says, I hold back my feet from every other way, evil way in order to keep your word. The word of God's like my protector, my accountability partner saying, don't do that. Don't hurt yourself. He continues in Mem and he says, I do not turn aside from your rules for you yourself have taught me. The word of God is like his tutor, his personal teacher. Some of you might go to university someday. We'll have a professor and they'll say, look in the syllabus. I want you to read this book. And then you go to buy the book and it's your teacher's name. He wrote the book. You better read it. God said, I wrote a book for you to read. If the teacher said, this is my book that I wrote, but if he walked up to you and said, I personally wrote it just for you, that's what the Bible is. God said, I wrote that just for you. I want a personal relationship with you. A friend, scripture says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And a coach, through your word precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate the false way. Father and son, we're on a hike. As the father was walking along, the son got ahead of him, got himself out on a rock that was a little steep. And out of nowhere, said, Dad, catch me! And he leaped. And the father remarks about the story. He says, my son laid on my shoulder. I did everything. I grabbed him and I put him down. I said, why did you do that? How could you just jump and then scream, Dad, catch me? He said, I knew you would. How did you know I would? Because you're my dad. Child of God. A knowable, eternal, empathetic person wrote a book for you that will be your advisor, your coach, your friend in any situation or season you go through. 
Is it possible that God hasn't been silent? Is it possible your Bible's been closed? This week, in your busyness, look at it as a way to punch the devil in the mouth for how distracted he has you. And submit to God's will for you to stop what you're doing for just a minute. Look at me. It's as if he says, stop, look at me, look at me. Turn the music off. Take that phone. Here, look at me. I want to tell you my will for you. You keep saying, where are you? Why aren't you? What? I'm right here. And this week, I want to encourage you, church, why not start with Psalm 119? Because maybe this season is a season of submission, a season to stop what you're doing and take the struggles of your authority and use this to grow yourself. Small groups, personal study, ask yourself, how could I better keep God's commands during this season of life? 